Let's take a look at some of these characteristics in Poe's words themselves. Let me read this passage from The Fall of the House of Usher, first published in 1839. During the whole of a dark, dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country, and at length found myself, as the shades of evening drew on, within the view of the melancholy house of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, I sensed an insufferable gloom pervading my spirit. I say insufferable, for the feeling was unrelieved by any of that half-pleasurable, because poetic, sentiment with which the mind usually receives even the sternest natural images of the desolate and terrible. I looked upon the scene before me, upon the mere house and the simple landscape features of the domain, upon the bleak walls, upon the vacant eye-like windows, upon a few rank sedges, and upon a few white trunks of decayed trees, with an utter depression of soul, which I can compare to no earthly sensation more properly than to the after dream of the reveler upon opium, the bitter lapse into everyday life, the hideous dropping off of the veil. I want to talk about some more of these narrators' voices before we sort of analyze them. Let's skip to William Wilson. This is the beginning of this tale. Let me call myself for the present William Wilson, the fair page now lying before me need not be sullied with my real appellation. This has been already too much of an object for the scorn, for the horror, for the detestation of my race to the uttermost regions of the globe. Have not the indignant winds brooded its unparalleled infamy? infamy? Oh, outcast of all outcasts, most abandoned. To the earth art forever dead, to its honor, to its flowers, to its golden aspirations, and a cloud dense, dismal, and limitless does not hang eternally between thy hopes and heaven. When discussing narrators like this, we get a very interesting thing going on in a literary context. When stories are told to us objectively, when we're given a piece of fiction or even a piece of prose that says, this is the way it is, then we as readers, of course, accept that. Even, it's, even if it's fictional, we accept the world as it's told to us because that's the information that the author is telling us. But when we come to know some of these tropes and learn to understand that the characters that are telling us what we need to know about a story are opium users, that they're liars, that they won't reveal their names, even their names to us, that changes the context of the entire story. Then we, the remarkable reader, suddenly know that we have to view this story in a very different way. We can't accept on the sur surface level what the narrator, what we assume is the unreliable narrator, tells us. Now we have to look for other clues because the sophisticated writer will give us enough clues. Yes, they'll tell us that a narrator is unreliable, but they'll also supply enough facts, enough meanings between the lines of the words that we go, aha, this may be a drug user and yet I may know this fact, I may know that fact. And in that way, it makes stories so much more interesting. We've uh, probably seen stories like The Telltale Heart and The Black Cat. Both narrators speak 
of not being mad. I won't read the entire passage, but, but we start true, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous. I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? And if you could think of that tone in your head all the way through, of course we know this narrator's mad, and we'll get to know the narrator is mad uh, quite well before the story goes too much further. In The Black Cat, a very similar narrator, but perhaps a little bit more sedate. For the most wild and most homely narrative which I am about to pen, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it in a case where my very senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad I am not, and very surely do I not dream, but tomorrow I die. And today I would unburthen my soul. My immediate purpose is to place before the world plainly, succinctly, and without comment, a series of mere household events, which sadly, if you know the story, will include taking a pin knife and cutting out a cat's eye, hanging that cat by the neck until dead, burying an ax deep into his wife's brain, and burying her in the cellar. Just mere series of household events. And of course, uh, he will go on to say and repeat that uh, you'll perceive in the circumstances I detail with awe nothing more than an ordinary succession of very natural causes and effects. This happened, so this happened. I think I'd be much more comfortable with the first madman than this one in many ways. We have yet another narrator, but once again, we come to Poe, we read the, the text, and we begin to question what's going on at the beginning of these stories. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitively settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. We teach, we teach many of us, many of the professors in this room teach freshman compositions. We teach introductions. What do you do in the introduction? This is a brilliant introduction because all of the rest of this story lends itself to explaining what these five sentences say. We'll find out, in fact, that this battle between Fortunato, between Montressor, this, this, this dispute between them that will lead to murder, perhaps has, perhaps, has religious leanings. And we get that from, from metaphors, from concepts, from one talking about being a mason. Oh, are you a mason? And if you know the history of the masons, you'll know that there's associations with Protestantism with the masons. So is this a battle between masons and Catholics, one would ask. If we do find that out, then we start looking at sentences like who the you is that's being addressed here. The you who so well knows the nature of my soul. Who knows the nature of one's soul? 
other than perhaps one that's being, then is receiving a confession. So, so elements like that become very important. Also, setting up the idea of, of the revenge that's going to take place, the idea that revenge is only sweet if I get away from, get away with it. And not only that, but if I'm going to take revenge, the person that I'm taking revenge upon must know that I'm doing it. So there's the ground rules set up at the introduction of this story. But once again, within the concept of the narrator being perhaps somewhat mad. So rather than these storytellers being objective, using empirical descriptions, they may be not quite reliable. They may be opium users. They may be liars. And by the way, uh, I love the pun Poe uses here. The idea of the fair page now lying before me. Yes, lying before me. Or is it lying before me? We're not sure what's going on. So opium users, alcoholics, calm, calculating murderers, plotting killers, seeking revenge. These are the people that tell us these stories. And as such, we must be careful when we interpret them. Once we've established unreliability, then we must use those clues to figure out what's going on. There is a uh, European critic named Nunning that talks about a number of signs that constitute a narrator's unreliability. I thought it worthy of sharing these with you. Intratextual signs, such as the narrator contradicting himself, having gaps in memory, lying to other characters or to us. Extratextual signs, such as contradicting the reader's general world knowledge of the imposed, of the proposed impossibilities within the parameters of logic and the world that we're given. And then a sense of the reader's literary competence. This includes the reader's knowledge about literary types, about knowledge of a genre, about stylistic devices, about the very things that I'm talking about. Hence, we learn as readers to look for unreliable narrators within Poe's fiction. And we gain competency in how to interpret those voices. We learn when to believe and when not to believe. One last thing I'll say about narrators, although this doesn't fit into the context of what I'm talking about with unreliability, but it is a narrator once removed. And what's important, if you didn't know it, is uh, Poe's detective fiction with murders in the Rue Morgue, uh, with uh, his other detective fiction. He creates the genre. Sir uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, in his first Sherlock Holmes novel, makes a direct nod He's not going to steal Poe without, you know, at least giving him a nod. He nods to the fact that uh, Sherlock Holmes is not unlike that character over in Paris, C. Auguste Dupin. And uh, what's remarkable about the way that Poe originally and Doyle later uses what we call a first-person observer narrator this is a first-person narrator, but it, this is not the protagonist. This is a narrator that's viewing the protagonist. Because inevitably, the, in these tales, the protagonist is the genius. The protagonist often knows, in using his typical armchair detective strategies, using his brilliant mind, using deduction and logic, the detective knows the solution to the mystery when it's told to him. If he were telling us the story, there would be no story. But having a first-person observer tell what's going on, able to discover the facts of the story as they're revealed to him and then to us, the audience, he and we get to play along. And there's the heart of the detective story that we've all become so familiar with.